All right. Women on the edge. All of us right here on the edge, ready to go. And all those that are watching later, we're going to talk about a couple other ladies tonight who um, are uh, some fun um, uh, some fun women in the word who definitely were on the edge of what was happening in the culture for their time and in um, and definitely people that we can look at for our own culture and say, what is going on? How can I emulate them? How do we understand what's going on? So let's go ahead and talk about these amazing women. Tonight, Women on the Edge, this is our series. Um, we've done several women in Genesis. This is jumping out of Genesis finally um, and going to a couple of ladies who um, are uh, still a part of uh, the, the story of the people of God, the people of Israel. And um, really pretty, actually pretty major in um, the history of the, the Israelite people. We're going to talk tonight about Deborah the Judge and JL the Just. Yep, got my alliteration in there. Two women who um, changed, literally changed the course of history. So a little bit of a trigger warning for anybody who is watching this. Um, there is a lot of um, violence in this, um, some pretty extreme violence. There's um, some uh, uh, sexual issue uh, things going on, possibly, possibly not. Um, and so um, please just be aware that I'm going to talk about all those things if you need to cover small children's ears or um, if it just might be a difficult topic for you personally. But I have mm -hmm. props tonight. We got our hammer, we got our our tent peg ready to go. Got two tent pegs actually, um, because if you're uh, a really good youth pastor, as I once got to be, then uh, you always have to have your props to keep the kids interested, or the or the ladies or the gentlemen. Let me introduce you to the characters in this story, because it is quite a story. It is. It is a definitely movie level <laughs> type of a story in our Bibles. You know, Judges has some great ones. The book of Judges, definitely. But this one has, has some great characters. We, it has great um, possibilities of maybe this happened, maybe this didn't happen. But we can definitely read some pretty cool things into it, into the drama. It's got a fantastic denouement or the, the apex of the story. It's got a great conclusion, um, and it's got um, a big, uh, a big musical ending, like everybody wants in their movies. So here's the characters: we got Deborah, judge and prophet over Israel, we, one of the greatest judges in the history of Israel. Um, some consider her the greatest. She, um, she had a, a, a ma major role. This one little story is a pretty significant. Um, aspect of the story of Israel. Then we have Barak. Barak was a general in the Hebrew army. He was a um, uh, from one of the tribes. He was he was a commander that Deborah knew well. She Deborah was his commander. Um, he was a general. I'm sorry for the Hebrews that she knew well that they have had a relationship. You can tell that right off from the beginning because she's saying, "Why haven't you do what done what you were told to do in the first place?" So they they immediately you see that they that they've been in a relationship. Um, uh, as far as like governing Israel for quite a while. Um, he wasn't afraid to take notes from his leader. He, <laughs> he was able to say, okay, Deborah, uh, my commander, what is it you want? What is it that you have for us? Um, and what do you want me to do? Then there's the next character is JL. JL was the wife of Heber from the tribe of the Kenites. Sounds like a strange way to introduce her, but that's going to be a very, very significant note for you guys um, when you find out all of the words in that little sentence right there mean a whole lot. Then we have Sisera, everybody say boo, because captain of the army of Jabin, the Canaanite king, he was, Jabin was the king, Sisera was his captain, Sisera was the guy who did uh, the king's bidding, and he commanded a huge force that included 900 iron chariots. That also is a very important fact that we are going to really dive into pretty soon. Okay, if you're looking to read a book in the Bible, like I said, you, this one's got a lot of drama. Judges is the book for you. It's like a Quentin Tarantino movie. It's full of good, a few good guys, a whole lot of bad, and a whole lot of violence going on in this drama, in this movie. So here's a few notes for you, though. If you want to read the whole book of Judges, 
I would suggest that you remember that it's not laid out chronologically, just like every other book um, that it seems to be when, when we're reading these stories, it's not necessarily a chronological tale. It's trying to get a point across. We saw this very true in Genesis. In this one, if you're just taking notes and you're like, oh, I think I'll read the book of Judges. And if you want to read it in some sort of chronological order, start with chapter one, go, oh, that was a good chapter, then skip all the way to chapter 17, read for a while, then go to 21, and then go back to chapter two and read for a while, and you'll get a little bit more understanding of the chronology. And why that might matter is just if you're trying to just kind of keep up with the characters and keep up with understanding what's happening um, within the bigger picture of Israel. And when you get into the books like Samuel and Kings, um, you'll see different uh, different um, references back to certain ones of these sorts, uh, stories and, and that kind of thing. So anyways, it's just a way of reading Judges that might help. Um, so let's start. Actually, the, the, the book of the story of Deborah is um, uh, in, in two chapters, chapter four and chapter five of Judges. And I'm just going to head read a little note from uh, Judges five where Deborah sings a song. It's the big musical number at the end of the story. She sings a song and at and, and, and the beginning of this thing, it, it, she says, in the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of JL, just really cool because of what JL did um, in chapter four, the main roads were deserted because travelers cut to the side roads. Villages were, de were deserted. They were deserted in Israel until I, Deborah, arose a mother in Israel. Oh, I love it. Let's go, Deborah. She knows who she is. She knows who JL is. She knows the characters in the story. She tells the story so well. But let's go ahead and talk about the story. Four and five chapters tell us this amazing time that the Israelites were, were ruled by the greatest judge in history, Deborah. Many teach that the only reason Deborah was Israel's leader was because Israel's men were unfit to judge, so we had to get a woman. La, 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 la. Okay, that's all uh, BS. God chose a woman for the job, they say, because they just uh, they needed to shame the men who should have taken leadership. Okay, all of that is a lie. You may have heard that though, because people will say, "Well, um, I, 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 I'm not sure if men, if women should be allowed to lead." And 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 I'm gonna look in my Bible to see. Look, it says right there, women should be silent. And somewhere in the New Testament, oh, look right there, women have to be in in uh, uh, under the priest of the home or, and the men. And ah, none of that's there. It's it's heresy. It, and it, it, egalitarians like me, we like to look at Deborah and say, "Look at her. She's the trump card. She's the one that proves. She's a prophet. She's a judge." And some people say that's not really true. She had never husband there she had to she had to um she was only there because there was no one else available but there's nothing in the text that says anything like that that women are never allowed to be in leadership or that she she had to be in leadership because there was no good man around it just says that this is who she was this is what she did and she did a great job at it so we love deborah for that reason so just like miriam deborah was a prophet made very clear in the text that's who she was the word that says now deborah uh a prophet the wife of lapidoth was leading israel at the time the word leading shapat i or shapat means judge or leader just like moses was a judge of israel and the leader of israel the word shapat means the ideas of national leadership, judicial decisions, political, military savior. That's what that word means. That's who she was. The only other person who got to be a prophet and a judge was Samuel. And she is one of the few women in scripture who is not defined by her relationship to her man. In fact, when it says right there in certain translations, the wife of Lapidoth, we're not totally sure that's what that means because it may just mean um, that uh, an, another connection to someone to, anyway, I'll get into that in a second, but I, I got ahead of myself. In Judges, <laughs> Lapida, Eshet Lapida, which means some ref, say, well, it means she was the wife of Lapida, but that word Eshet doesn't necessarily mean wife of, it means woman. It's just woman. Woman who is what some people believe, someone who has a fiery or a fierce personality. That's what that Lapidot word refers to. It's not necessarily a man named Lapidot. So it's possible she may not be married. We don't know. We don't really care. 
Um, but what we do know is she is a woman, it appears a woman on fire, a woman who is fierce and fiery. We love that fierce woman. Woman on fire reminds me of the Hunger Games. If you haven't seen the movie, the Hunger Games, of course, the books are fantastic. It's a kid's book, but I, you guys know by now I love um, YA fiction, young adult fiction. But um, uh, but Hunger Games was great. And the movie was really fun because it showed this at one point they called her the girl on fire and the, and the costumer for this big event lit her whole costume on fire. And, 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 and she had this she was able to go it wasn't real fire it was fake fire but it but but she didn't burn up and that's kind of what i picture when i see uh this this phrase um for deborah deborah is a strong example of a fierce woman whom god used to lead and rescue his people her brilliant words that you see in in chapter five are um as well as, of course, her actions continue to encourage us even to this day um, of words like in Judges 531, may those who love you, Lord, shine like the rising sun at its brightest. I mean, that's some pretty stuff right there. She should be uh, writing some some uh, scripture, some, uh, some hymns for our uh, services today. Okay, so let's go into Judges 4. We're going to get down to the basics of the story. Very simple story, all in one book. And it says, um, again, the very first verse, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Ooh, the word again isn't a very pleasant word. We're only on chapter four, only a couple of judges in, and we've already got evil being done in the eyes of the Lord. This happens quite a bit throughout judges. In fact, it happens over and over. Every chapter seems to begin or end this way um, that the Israelites were again doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera was the commander of his army. That's an important character. Remember him? He had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. They cried to the Lord for help. The bad guys had 900 iron chariots. They These chariots are a very big part of the story going forward. Chariots and chariots and chariots. And everybody knew, the Israelites knew, and everybody that surrounded knew that this King Jabin the king of Canaan, he had 900 iron chariots. Now some, um, you know, you've probably heard that sometimes when a big number like that was given in ancient literature, it was sort of a, um, well, it, it might have had um, 10 wives, but we called it a thousand wives or something like that. They would exaggerate a lot. But there does seem to be some history to this thing with the whole 900. There is some historical other writings that refer to a kingdom that had 900 or a very large number of iron chariots. So um, it's quite possible that uh, this is a, an accurate thing, an accurate statement about his many, many chariots. Sounds like he's compensating. Okay, so the thing is, though, Israel had none, <laughs> zero chariots. You'd think... They would have like found found some iron somewhere and made like maybe one for you know Deborah or somebody, um, but no, they had zero chariots. All right, so Deborah the prophet, she was a judge of Israel. She held court under the palm of Deborah, which I love because I love palm trees, and uh, and and this is where she held court. It's possible some think that when it refers to this, that it may be that she owned a palm grove or that she she grew palms as a as a business of some sort. But somehow or another, she was known for these the, these palms or for this area, this palm of Deborah. And Israelites came from all over the country so she could rule in their cases, so she could uh, be a governor and a ruler and a judge and a leader for them. The other leaders of the other tribes would come to her and she would as a prophet and she spoke what God um, wanted for them. Barak was a general. Barak was a general in the Hebrew army and notably he was Deborah's subordinate. They were not equal, he was underneath her as her his his she was his commander deborah's first recorded action is to summon barack she says you need to come i need to remind you of something that god has already said that you are supposed to know remember this you were supposed to take ten thousand israelites troops lure sisera and his iron chariots and army into a battle down by the river kishon river and which is very significant and the lord will give uh, him victory um, God promised victory over Sisera, but Barak had apparently hesitated. And he, he says he would only go into battle, though, 
with Deborah by his side. He says, okay, okay, yeah, I remember, I remember, okay, um, but I'm gonna need a little help. Could you just come with me and then everything will be cool. I don't mind doing the thing that God wants me to do, but I'm gonna need a little extra assistance. Could you be with me? I'm going, not going unless you go, Barack told her. I'll definitely go with you, she replied. But I'm warning you that the Lord is going to let a woman defeat Sisera, and no one will honor you for winning the battle. Although I will give, you know, Barack a little, a little pat on the back for uh, definitely going to battle. He did that. Um, so that's good. So here's a little note for you. We do not know why Barack would not go to battle with Deborah. We don't know if he was afraid. That's a lot to assume. It might have been that he had, he was a bit of a coward. It may have been because he wanted a wise prophet beside him, and maybe she hadn't been available until now. Um, we don't really know. There's and so to assume things, you're just you're it's assuming because we don't have any clue within any of the text anywhere that would tell us why he didn't want to go to battle without Deborah. We just know that's what happened. So when Sisera heard that Barak was leading the Israel, now Sisera is the bad guy. When he hears that Barak is leading the Israelites against him, he goes ahead and he gets all of his chariots together and all of his troops. And some believe this could have been up to 300,000 men, 300,000 troops and all the chariots. So we got horses and chariots and all the stuff that comes with sending that many people into battle. So Deborah told Barak, okay, Sister is making some moves. You, we know what's going on here. That's the day of victory God has given us. It's come. Let's do this. So Barack and Deborah, with everybody they could muster, they got themselves 10,000 men and they go to battle. The Lord throws the Canaanites into a panic and they are defeated in a bloodbath. Now there's there's all these things that refer to all the notes and all the different tabs that I had open over the last couple of days, getting this ready, all refer to the, um, the things getting stuck in the mud and the rain and all this stuff. And it's not actually in the text. So I started doing some more digging and I realized that it seems that Josephus, the historian who was alive after like Jesus times, um, he wrote some things about this time and he referred to rain and mud plus the fact that they were going down to god had specifically said lure them to this river and so it seems that because of the, being uh, at this river and the horses the iron chariots god's always thinking and he and maybe sister didn't realize it they got those horses and those chariots stuck in the mud and apparently there was some rain coming as well so during the battle sisera the commander his um, his chariot gets stuck in the mud. So he just takes off. Everybody's getting defeated. All of his troops are defeated. He takes off on foot. He leaves his troops um, to fend for themselves. And Barack is like, yeah. And he, um, he and his people, though, they got to go after the rest of the men. They got to go after the army. And they don't really quite get to catch Cicero right then. Cicero escapes. And he heads somewhere. He's like, ah, I know exactly where to head. You know, you always got to know you're out. You always, just in case, even though things are looking good, you always got to have a plan for your out. Well, Cicero, he knew his, his out. He knew exactly where he needed to go to be safe. So enter Heber. He's the husband of Jael. Remember I told you earlier, Jael is, is referred to as, as the wife of this guy, Heber. Well, he's a pretty big deal. And let me tell you why. He was not an Israelite. He is a Kenite. And the Kenites notes. Kenites were a desert tribe. Moses' father-in-law, Moses, that should be an apostrophe, his father-in-law Jethro, he is from this tribe. Remember when Moses takes off into the desert, he's running away from the bad guys in Egypt, and he takes off for uh, uh, to escape, and he, he runs into this tribe, he meets um, uh, Jethro and, and, and his people, and he gets married and all this stuff. That's the Kenites. They are not Israelites, that, but they showed kindness to Israel when they traveled through the wilderness, and they have been friendly neighbors with them in Canaan. So now that Israel Israelites live in Canaan, uh, they, they are uh, neighbors, and they take care of each other, and they, they're, they're, they're good guys. They're good neighbors, just like a neighbor should be. So Heber, he lived in peace with the Israelites, but he also lived in peace with the Canaanite king Jabin, and they had a treaty together, and 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 this was an ally that Sisera knew about. He knew um, he was an enemy of Israel, but he's like, well, Heber, he's got a, a treaty with my king, and we're all kind and friendly, so I mean, this should work. 
So that's the way he takes off. In ancient times, now, here's some notes that are very important for the rest of the story. So take note. Here we go. Hospitality. In ancient times, hospitality was culturally the most important of social cultural norms. How you cared for a stranger was more important than how you cared for your own children. Women were not to offer hospitality to men. Only men could offer it to men. Protecting a guest was a huge part of hospitality, protecting them even against bad, the bad things that might happen. And you can see this all throughout the Old Testament and a lot of the stories you can see the a guest coming in um, and it being uh, taken care of better than their own people. Women in, in this culture, women, especially in this Kenite desert nomadic uh, tribe, they had their own tents. For one thing, there could be quite a few wives. Um, uh, they, um, women were, um, especially like with Israelites or different ones that women were considered unclean at certain times of the month, or they just didn't want to have, men didn't want to have to deal with the women. So they had their own tent. They would, if they were, I guess, high enough up, they, uh, one woman might have her own tent as opposed to, you know, sharing it like a harem if there were several wives. So, but women were separate from the men as far as their tents go. It's important notes. The Kenites were tent dwelling people. Everything that had to do with the tent was the woman's work. In this culture, women took care of the tent. You guys probably already know all this stuff because you know a lot about JL. I'm sure you've heard about her before, but it is important just in case you didn't know those very important things. So Sisera, bad guy, he runs to Heber's camp because he clearly believed that this ally of his king, Jabin, would protect him. Instead, he encountered Heber's wife, JL. And this is where the story gets fun. JL sympathized with the Israelites, just like she was, the rest of her family did. Heber um, sympathized with the, with the Israelites. He was a friend to them. And JL though, she took it a little bit to the next level. Heber was probably more like Switzerland. Like they just, he just tried to stay out of, the Kenites tried to stay out of everybody's problems. We're just going to be nice to everybody. We can do business together. We can use, take our tilled tents, put it on this land and that land and everybody gets along and I don't have to bother with anything. JL, she had a different plan. Some say that Sisera, as he walked up to the tent, JL saw him coming. He walks up to the, he takes off running, actually he's running away from the battle. I, I didn't look it up. I don't really know how far away maybe he was from the battle. But anyway, he, he goes over there and um, he, it, some say that, well, sister probably asked, it looks like he asked to hide in her tent. That is not true. She, she does the, she does the asking. The text actually um, tells us that JL went out to meet Sisera and invited him into her tent. Sisera went to the tent that belonged to JL, Heber's wife. She came out to greet him and said, come in, sir, please come on in. Don't be afraid. Significantly, JL invited Sisera into her own tent, not her husband's home. Maybe she cut him off knowing, oh, well, he was about to go see my husband. And I, you know, I know how that's going to work. I'm just going to go ahead and take care of this right now. Come in, my Lord, come in with me. Don't be afraid. Sisera did not seem to hesitate. He went in once inside. He asked her for some water to drink. He was thirsty. He'd been running like a coward away from the battle. Instead, she gave him milk <laughs> to quench his thirst. Very interesting choice for JL. Um, two possibilities with this. One, milk was actually considered an aphrodisiac in the ancient Jewish world. Also, we also happen to know um, these days, milk can help us put, go to sleep. So one or the other, we don't really know why she offered him milk, but we do know that she didn't give him what he asked for. Kind of significant. Sisera likely thought he was safe in the tent of Jael, be possibly because of her husband's position. Maybe because she gave him this milk, he got sleepy. Plus he'd been running like a coward and he was a pretty bad dude and he just needed to get some uh, to go to sleep and may have been aphrodisiac. Don't really know. He may have assumed that she was propositioning him. She may have deliberately implied that she was. Married nomadic women had their own tents. And these female spaces were strictly off limits to men, except for their husbands. In fact, in these times, a man seldom ever, you ever, never see this in Bible uh, stories or in any other history stories that I've read so far. <laughs> a man does not enter a woman's tent unless he's planning on having sex. It just didn't happen. 
either way, no matter what the reason was that she did it or that happened, we do know he just let his guard down and he was exhausted. JL offered him a blanket and after a long run away from a losing battle, he told JL to guard the door and he told her to lie for him. He's breaking some hospitality rules too. Too He, he says, lie for me. He goes into a tent he's not supposed to go into um, and um, ask for something to drink. Not supposed to do any of those things, hospitality rules. But then he drifts off to sleep and he feels very safe in the tent of a friend. While he was sleeping from exhaustion, the scripture tells us, Heber's wife, and it's kind of funny that it refers to, to her that way. It's not just jail. It actually says Heber's wife. It's like the text is trying to remind us, oh, this is Heber's wife. Heber had this treaty that it mentions a little bit in a couple of verses before. Jail took a tent peg. Oh, look, I have a tent peg with me. Grabbed a hammer, boom, and went silently to Sisera. One version I read said she tiptoed up to Sisera. She hammered the peg into his temple and drove it into the ground. Oh, and by the way, he died. <laughs> the scripture actually did have to tell us that. <laughs> um, this is where Barack found him. So Barack is running as fast as he can because he wants to catch the bad guy and he finally gets there. And this is what he finds. Just then Barack arrived after chasing Sisera. JL went out to meet him and said, come and I'll show you the man you're after. JL went out and met him too. So, so she's apparently got pretty good eyesight. So he went in, Barack did, and there was Sisera lying dead with the stake through his head. <laughs> ah, way to go, JL. She left the stake in his head. I thought that was kind of funny. I mean, I guess she's not going to necessarily pull it out, but yeah, there it is. In the head, she's showing off like, look what I did. Look what we got here. The bad guy. You know, they probably heard about this battle. JL probably knew that this and her and, and her tent peak fellow tent people, her husband. I'm sure that gathering an army the way each of these um, nations were doing, these, these tribes and different people were doing, this was a, 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 a very significant thing. And she probably knew, and it had been talked about by possibly her husband and others um, about this guy, Sisera, about, she may have even met him before. Um, and um, so she, she seemed to have a plan in place. She knew what she needed to do quickly and it took care of it quickly. Um, a scholar, Mark Mousko, who definitely you need to go to her website for all women <laughs> related topics about the Bible. She's amazing. Um, several um, scholars acknowledge that the language in JL's story, especially when the song is sung by Deborah later, we'll see, is very sexually charged. Um, it's possible that there's a lot of innuendo, double entendre is being used as a literary device in JL's and Ruth's story. Um, there's reference to him falling at her feet, and there's reference in Ruth's story about being at Boaz's feet. Those um, have uh, uh, innuendos to them, um, and so uh, there's, there's a lot to this. It's possible, um, some believe that it's possible that he raped her. It's possible that um, she allowed um, herself to to uh, be abused so that she could entice him in. It's um, uh, very likely that, uh, more likely pro probably that he um, uh, took advantage of her in some way, but um, it adds to the irony that Sisera, the great warrior is taken down by a woman. It seems that ancient people, as with many people today, like their stor stories and their songs spiced up. And so you see, instead of just flat out saying exactly what happened, you see these innuendos um, uh, as part of the, the story so that we're, pe people in those days would have kind of known what they were talking about and we're still trying to figure it out. Um, Israelites, the, the, the Hebrews were very earthy is the way Mark Mouska says it, <laughs> very earthy and uh, uh, more so than some of us would like to think these stories in the Bible are uh, got a lot to them. So this is the way I like to think of it. So Barack was probably thinking, so I didn't get to kill Sisera during the battle because you know all the horses, they're having like panic attacks and I and I can, but I can get him now. I'll go and I'll get him and then I'll be a hero. And then he walks into JL's tent and he's like, dang girl. And then he like gives her a high five. Like, yeah, you go, you did it. Way to go. I'm so proud of you. I was kind of hoping to get him, but you got him. So he's dead. Let's go. So that's the way I like to picture Barack. He seems like a pretty good guy. He knows 
who's in charge and he's willing to uh, to just get the job done and he's just happy that the job is done. So high fives to JL from Barack. JL was remarkably brave to invite this fierce warrior, a general no less, into her tent. She seems very quick-witted by giving him milk to drink instead of water. Her quick thinking, her resourcefulness is also shown when she used what was at hand, a tent peg and hammer to assassinate Israel's enemy. JL used the tools that she had been given. For her, there was no better weapon than a tent peg. She liked, likely had an extensive experience putting tents together with tent pegs. She knew how to use a hammer. She was skilled with this tool. She used the resources that were right there given to her in this situation. She didn't run around going, man, I wish I had a sword. I don't know what to do. She knew exactly what she wanted to do. She simply took the tools she had right there with her at her disposal, and she did what was needed. Just like in Corinthians, us today, we can look at this, we can go, okay, well, I'm not running around with tent pegs and hammers. I don't really know. I don't really camp a lot. What am I supposed to do? Even if you do camp, do you have one available to you all the time? But what we do have, but we got our New Testament that tells us we have our spiritual gifts. We're God's people. He gives us other all kinds of gifts. And and in First Corinthians, it says a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. We got teaching. We got prophecy. We got healing. We got miracles. We got we got helps, hospitality as a gift. All of those things. JL, she's using her hospitality gift. <laughs> In a different way than probably most of us would use our hospitality gift, but she definitely knew how to use it the right way. So uh, these are people who are on the edge, right? So literally, JL, she was not a Jewish woman, but she was literally on the edge of the Hebrew society. This is our series, is women who are on the edge. And sometimes it's a it's it's a double meaning. It's supposed to be women who are on the edges of these stories. JL was on the edge. She's not an Israelite, but she's right there on the edge. In fact, quite a few of the women we've talked about, like Hagar and, and um, I can't remember if Tamar was, but so, several of these other women um, were, were not um, Jewish women, but they had significant pieces of the story um, uh, of what, uh, what the, the, the big story that is being told in, in the Bible. And, but these women were like on the edge as well. They're ready to go. They're always like on the edge with the meaning that we have in our culture as well, which is just ready to go. Um, and sometimes maybe even a little bit angry, but ready to go living where she did jail, recognized the persecution of the Israelites by the Canaanites. Canaanites would not let the Israelites have, um, uh, be able to sell their products. They couldn't have their, um, they didn't have ask, access to good, the good land or the good roads or the good products. Um, all of those things um, would have been known by JL and her family. JL chose to deliver justice for the Israelites. Deborah was the judge, but JL, she's the judge's hammer. Yeah, I'm taking that metaphor as far as I can. She held their oppressor accountable for what he had done and delivered a verdict that loudly proclaimed that she was on the side of Israel. Hmm, I wonder what her husband thought. I don't think she cared. Just as Deborah had prophesied, the Lord told Sisera, sold Sisera into the hands of a woman. Prophecy, boom, done. But she, it was she who delivered justice. She could have waited for someone else. She, JL could have waited for her husband. She could have waited for Barack to show up. She could have waited for Commander Deborah, the judge, to walk in. She could have waited and 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 thought about and sat and thought about it. She could have she spent some time in prayer, but maybe she already did all that. She was ready to go. Instead, she took care of the problem herself because she knew she was the one most capable to do so. And she struck in him in the head. I was thinking about that. I was thinking, why in the head? Why not like through the heart or just like pin his arm to the ground? I mean, you know, why like straight into the head? What was it that gave her that ability to say, nope, we're going straight in? It could be, like I said, she, there may have been a, a, a rape involved. It may have been uh, like, you know, I'm going to deal with this all the way going straight to the head. But there are allusions to Genesis 3 um, with the woman, the 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 pronouncement that's made of the woman after the fall, there's a pronouncement by God made on the man and then the woman, Eve. I will put hostility between you and the woman, talking to the, actually this is to the serpent, um, and between your offspring and her offspring, her offspring will strike your head and you will strike his heel. This is also goes all the way to uh, 
to Jesus coming as well. But this is something that cannot be ignored, this allusion to a, a head of an enemy being struck. Ooh. Struck. JL is a wonderful example of a woman who exercised her agency, her personhood. She knew who she was, doing what she believed was right according to her own knowledge and her what, what she understood about the time. She understood what was going on with Israel, it looks like. She understood what was, um, she probably understood the treaty that her own husband um, and their, the Kenite tribe had, um, but she, she um, knew exactly who she was and she made a decision that needed to be made according to her own knowledge and discernment. It is possible that her choice was in opposition to her husband, most likely, because it's mentioned, uh, just her husband is mentioned a couple of times. So it seems that the writer does want us to pay attention to that as he is described as having a treaty with Sisera's king and is likely why Sisera chose to run to this camp. She broke the ancient Near East codes of hospitality, considered sacred, when she murdered her invited guests. But she is concerned much more with what is right than what others expect of her. Jael acted according to her own convictions. Her choice altered the course of history for both the Canaanites and the Israelites. Some Christians um, might have you believe the patriarchal Christians would have us believe that women were minor players throughout all the Bible narrative serving as only placeholders like, oh, we're going to stick a woman right here so you can look at all the things the men are doing. No, that is not what is happening. Definitely not in this story. But God never indicates that he has a preference for male action over female action. Humans do that. God does not do that. Both Deborah and JL subverted cultural expectations for women. They flexed their authority to make difficult choices and overcame obstacles. These women were major players in God's plan for the world. They were women to be reckoned with. This story is part of this recurring pattern throughout the Old Testament in which Israel <laughs> keeps defeating enemies with like nothing like just with a few little tools and things instead of big giant weapons and chariots ah! and it's like tim the tool man ah, ah, ah. that's what the israelites were in this case israel has no shields or spears but conquers instead with a peg and a workman's a workwoman's hammer uh, there's another judge um, in the book of Judges called Shamgar. He defeats the Philistines with a cattle prod. That's a fun one. Gideon, he wins with jars and trumpets. Woo, woo, woo. That's a great VeggieTales uh, video. Um, the, a Philistine king is killed by a millstone thrown over a wall by a woman. Yay, women throwing millstones. The Israelites bring down Nineveh with praise songs and marching around, and of course their faith. And then of course, David killed Goliath with a slingshot and a stone. And I'm sure there's some few other examples as well, but there's a whole lot of these examples of the tools that were close by and the, and, and the faith in God, doing what God asked them to do, doing it quickly, not hesitating, going for it and, and, and knowing that uh, God would bring them a victory. We, you should also read Deborah's song in chapter five, the very next chapter. There's a really pretty song. Considered, it is considered one of the oldest pieces of Hebrew poetry in history, not just like Bible stuff, like Hebrew poetry. It is a beautiful recap of the victory that we read about in chapter four. And according to my favorite theologian, Scott McKnight, it is considered, he writes a masterpiece look at her theology. His book, A... Um, uh, blue, uh, the, uh, the Blue Parakeet, got to read that book if you like theology, and um, it has a whole lot in there about Deborah. Many believe that uh, Deborah pro probably very likely wrote Psalm 68 as well, which is a fun one for you guys to read. Um, you will recognize the first opening lines immediately um, as one of, if you've been in the church very long, it's one of those songs that we sing, um, and um, it will be very similar. It, it is written very similarly to this uh, chapter five song. So that's why a lot of historians believe that it's the same um, author, the same songwriter. So Deborah's war actually changed history. Any dreams that Sisera and his king had to use those 900 chariots to defeat other countries like Egypt, that which was close by, and become a world power. Yeah, Canaan, we're going to take our 900 chariots and we're going to we're gonna go kill some other people. Um, they got stuck in the mud. No plans. No, no, no more plans. No, no way that was gonna work. 
um, when the Lord sent the rain. And Deborah's war effectively took the Canaanites out off of the world stage. Now they still, you know, hung around and caused problems, but the Israelites were then able to move to the fertile valleys. They were able to sell their produce and their products on the roadways. And the reason we know this is because within the song that um, De Deborah sings in chapter five, she references this roadways and things like that. Kind of cool. Um, when the victory is celebrated in song, there are three main characters, again, three women. And you're like, wait, I only remember two women, Deborah, JL. Well, you're going to be surprised. Deborah throws in an extra woman in the song that is hilarious. All right. Deborah is described as a, in the song, this is in the song in chapter five. She's described as a mother in Israel, a prophet who speaks for God a judge who settles disputes, a military commander. She's a songwriter. She's got, she's just wonderful. We just love this woman. She's like, she's like the quadruple threat. You know, in Broadway, they say you're a triple threat if you can sing and act and dance. She's like a quadruple threat. She can do all these things. And she's going for like the Bible EGOT. You know what the EGOT is? The Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, Tony. If you get that, there's only like a few people in history that have ever gotten that. Lin-Manuel got it, I think. And, and, uh, uh, Whoopi Goldberg's gotten it, some other people, but it's a big deal to get all. Well, Deborah, she got, she's got all of them. She's got all the awards. She can do all the stuff, the big stuff that we like to say. If you're a, a someone we're paying attention to in the Bible, you got to do the prophet stuff and the commanding stuff and the killing bad guys stuff and the and writing song stuff. Well, she's doing all of it. Okay, then second person, second woman mentioned in the song is our favorite, our hammer-wielding JL, the wife of a Kenite chieftain, big deal. She took it upon herself to break the Kenites' treaty with the Canaanite king. She tricked Sisera, the commander of the Canaanite army, to drop his guard, and she coolly drives that spike right through his brain. I, I kind of like to picture of her going straight in through the ear you know she needed a little help snuck in there she's got uh, got those soft soft little steps and then this is nuts this is what Deborah does at the very end of her song the very last couple of verses of her song she mentions Sisera bad guy Sisera's mother and and this is the only place she appears in in the story she in the song you've got to read it you guys she is relishing the thought of this mother's grief. It's really intense. She's imagining in the song, she's imagining her looking out the window for Sisera. Where's my son? He's probably busy with the battle and he's going to bring home all the loot that he plundered from Israel. It's going to be so great. I'm watching for him. She's imagining this mother. Dang, y'all. Deborah is cold, straight up cold. She is without a heart when it comes to truth. She says, this is a bad guy. The mama, she don't even deserve to have this kid back. And I'm happy that she's sad because he is a terrible, terrible person who has brought grief and, and horror to Israel for all these many years. So yeah, Deborah, she's a cold woman, but she is also the queen. Okay. Metaphor and metaphor queen. And the peg through the temple is pretty unforgettable for JL. In this song, she says, Deborah says, May JL be blessed above all women. She talks about how she's above all tent dwelling women, which some people, some scholars think that that may be referring to the tent dwelling women of Genesis, the uh, Sarah and, and Rebecca and Rachel and, and Leah and these very important women that are part of the patriarch story. It may be that she's talking about that, and this is JL who's not even an Israelite. And then he asked for water, it says, and she provided milk. She's like talking about the trickery. She crushed his head, a very important part of this. She scattered, shattered and pierced his skull. And at her feet, he sank. This is the reference I was talking to earlier. And he lay flat and there he fell dead. This is a, a very intense, beautiful song. I would be fun to learn, know how to sing it. There's no way to do that. But, uh, but it's an unforgettable um, description of JL and the why she is blessed. She is blessed. She is blessed for putting a spike to someone's head, for tricking someone. She is blessed be, as, as, as not even being an Israelite woman, but she heard God. She knew what she needed to do. She did it quickly and did it well with what she had in her hands. And the Lord and the land was peaceful for 40 years. This is a very big deal, this statement that is made at the end of, of this chapter. And then it goes on to the next judge. But here it is. And, and the land was peaceful 
for 40 years. That's a long time. That's a generation, 40 years that Deborah and JL and Barack brought. Um, so let's talk about us. So you yourself may not be a charismatic, bold leader like Deborah. You may see your life as a little bit smaller, like um, not like all those women out there doing the big things on Instagram. Look at me. I'm doing stuff for God. You can see it on my social media. I mean, we're comparing ourselves to them or even if we're just comparing ourselves to different women we know um, in the church, we can seem and feel a lot smaller. We're not usually out there doing the big, bold leadership, prophet type things. But maybe because of who you are and what you have been through, you've got some skills as well. You may be a great listener. Hey, you can listen. You can maybe you can change a tire. You always carry band-aids with you. These are important things. You may know how to navigate some really difficult situations that other people don't know how to navigate. A death in the family or a divorce or face a scary diagnosis for yourself or for someone else. Your abilities, those skills, that's a part of what you have in your package. You may not be walking around with a hammer unless you change a lot of tires, although you may. You may be really good with a hammer. You may be someone who can, can fix things around a house, and there are others who need your help with that, and you're being available to them and being able to be that quick thinker and being able to take care of situations quickly. That's the tools, the skills that you have. Your experience and your random skills matter. They matter to God. They matter to me. I may need your skills as well, but, and they matter to your neighbors. They may matter to the people uh, around you. And and in in this simple little life, we don't live in tents for the most part, unless you choose to, you know, go camping. But you, you are, we're not out there doing that. But we're we're doing um, the stuff that we do, and God has given us these abilities. He's given us these um, skills that we can use to change our life and change other people's lives. He didn't need JL to be able to speak to thousands or to command an army or plan a battle. That wasn't what God needed from JL. He needed that from Deborah and she did her job. She didn't even need to hear God for the whole nation. That wasn't her job either. She didn't probably ever get to meet all of the rest of these Israelites the way um, others did, but but she she was there in her tent and she did her thing. She just needed to do the right thing at the right time with the one who was right in front of her. She took care of what was right there in front of her, took care of, of the, she had the strength to do that. She, she, had, she had the skills to take care of this. She probably had a little bit of a plan. She'd thought about it. She'd had time to work through it. She knew what her theology was about Israel, her convictions about Israel, who, she, who was the good guys, knew was the bad guys. She had already worked through those those bigger issues. And because she had taken the time to, to work through that, to think through that, she was then able to make a quick decision. I'm all about the research. If you know me at all, you know, I love to know stuff, to ask questions, to figure out well, what does this mean? I was just talking to somebody the other day about what is, what is a covenant exactly? What does that mean? I, you know, people going through this and that, what, what is a marriage and covenants and that, you know, I want to know those things. So, so I might have to, to be ready to answer those things because those are bigger questions. What is forgiveness? What is, what is um, some of these big questions about who a woman is and who, who, uh, what, a, what, what our relationships are with each other? What is required of us? Those kind of things are important. And if you have the time to read a few things or, or talk to people about it, talk about the bigger, deeper things so that you can be ready with good answers or right answers. Just be able to say, you know what, I'm still thinking about that. I'm deconstructing in that area. I want to know more about that. So let's, maybe we can talk through it and work through it together. Um, even that kind of an answer is important in our relationships. Uh, the thing you think is just a small skill that comes so easily to you, like maybe it's public speaking or talking to people, or it may be like my husband told me a story uh, the other day about he was, he had to meet uh, with someone about a, uh, uh, in, at a, a, a retirement home about a family member and, and had to work through, you know, what, what, you know, some, some upgrading of care and things like that. And, um, and as he finished, he said to the two uh, uh, managers of the place that he was meeting with, who he's, he'd had a very nice conversation with. And he said, oh, can I pray for you? And he said, they both threw up their arms and said, yes, please do. And he got to pray for them. That's a skill that he has. He's good at. It. He likes to do it. He can pray for people at the drop of a hat. 
and 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 people love that people want that and he could do it i probably wouldn't have thought about it i just would have been happy that we'd had a good conversation and came to a good conclusion but he was thinking of the next thing and that was a skill that he has comes easily to him and um and that could be used that helped them to have a connection then with the lord and and uh, instill faith in them and and uh and ask for god to do things and bless the place so you your skill boom you right there can be used much bigger things when used by god always got to give our stuff to god our skills to god so in De in deborah's song there's this great thing i made a little uh graphic of it the other day because i was reading it and and anytime i see something kind of cool like that or a cool quote i end up making a graphic graphic of it i don't know why because i can put it on my instagram i don't know i liked it but this is in in her song she says march on my soul be strong i mean this song of hers was amazing you guys but 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 she's speaking to herself march on keep moving forward speaking to herself my stroll she's telling herself be strong we can say that to other people be strong come on you got this you can be strong and that's important but we have to say it to ourselves a lot too and you can take that from what Deborah was was doing, she had just won a big battle and and was in the middle of a great peacetime and was able to lead her people in a in a. It's much easier to lead people when they're happy than when they're sad, right? And now all the Israelites were happy with her and were happy with with their new situation, beating the king, the bad king, and but she's still telling herself, "Be strong, come on, keep it up, be strong, my soul, be strong." That's what you can say for yourself. You always have, um, you're always only one choice away. From a bolder faith just choosing to do um the the thing that god has for you to do is is a, a major part of of your just moving forward step by step in in the faith that that you yourself and the skills and the gifts that god gave you i saw this uh cool uh i, I love uh, Risa Rodell's um, graphics, and um, she she made this. It's actually about a, a TV show where the woman uses an axe. But I immediately thought of <laughs> of JL, and it says, "What kind of woman doesn't have an? We'll say a hammer. What kind of woman doesn't have a hammer? We all got hammers. We all got something that we can deal with the enemy in quickly. A skill that we have, a skill that we can can use quickly for the Lord and um and do the things that uh, He has us for for us to do." Does anybody have any questions, any thoughts about this lesson tonight? I saw that my little thing started acting funny. I hope you guys could still hear me. The interweb acted crazy for a second. Thoughts or questions? I have a, I have a statement. You have a what? Sorry. I have a statement. Oh, a statement. Okay. Do you have a hammer? Melissa has two axes. Just two axes. <laughs> All right. Well, I wish I could see one right now, but yeah, two axes are good, good to have at all times. You keep one close by. You never know. And see, Melissa is one of the few people who I would trust with an ax, not myself. She, she grew up actually knowing how to use one. You don't, exactly. don't give one to me. To get it. I have other, I have the skills of speaking publicly. That's not always needed, but, uh, but um, yeah, having a, a good friend like I have in Melissa that has an ax and knows how to use it that's what you want <laughs> that's funny good for us to know carrie thanks <laughs> no problem <laughs> Stacey, i liked how you explained the the story of jay or um i mean i've heard that story many many times and actually i like to use that nickname on <laughs> various different things but um just uh that no she she invited him in and then just the significance of women having their own tents and that that tent was only used for pretty much one specific purpose for her to live and then her husband to come so it was kind of interesting clarity on some of that well, that i didn't know we're not, we're not totally sure nobody no no scholar could be in agreement on that there's just thoughts you know but uh um uh, but uh, it was definitely against cultural norms. I mean, she was, it seems she, she was a part of inviting him in, but then he may have taken advantage, um, but she seemed to, to do something about it when she needed to do something about it. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, it's it, the, you know, that's my favorite part is the cultural history stuff, all those facts, because I think that's what, that's how we truly understand these stories. Um, that's why, you know, it's not just about coming up with a cute little Bible study, 
it's it's like, well, what's really going on here? As much as we can t possibly figure out, because th those truths are what gets the light a little bit deeper into us. Those stories um, are deeper than just the idea of, oh, you should you should have an axe. I don't know. Have a, I mean, have a have a hammer. I had somebody prophesy over me years ago that I had a hammer, but I think that the person was actually being mean to me because they were remembering, I think they were like, uh, I've had somebody describe me one time as always um, being a hammer, always looking for a nail, um, and uh, which was an insult <laughs> at the time. I, they were trying to make it an insult. I didn't take it that way because I, I don't have a problem being a hammer, <laughs> but because, um, um, hammers have a job you know but yeah so i'm not sure if that person was actually prophesying over me but it's like yeah but i don't care i like it i like i like jl i like deborah i feel very close to them um personality wise the way i uh, envision them i know that they can be scary just like i can be scary um with people um and and they can be scary for people to think well i have to get to that level but that's what that's what i'm trying to say is it's not about becoming a great leader it's not be about being able to act somebody or hammer somebody or tent peg somebody it's about i'm um, using what god has given you those skills that he's given you that are right there sometimes like i said it's about praying for somebody or or being a different kind of hospitable <laughs> um or it may be just you just um you hear about a problem and you say, well, let me go with you to meet with that principle. I, I know a little bit about, about that situation. Let me help you out. I may have words that you don't have um, or, or helping someone who's on the street who desperately needs new socks. I mean, things like that. And you know how to find socks. Um, so yeah, it's, it's using what God has given you, but, uh, but it's not just about the everyday stuff. It's about doing the big things. And I think he's, he can use our little gifts to do the big things and change the course of events where they need to be changed for God. All right. Well, there is, a, there is a, a verse in the Bible about my word is a, is like a hammer. You could take that prophetic word. Where is that? My word is like a hammer. And I, I, I have to like research again to remember where that is, but I know it's in there. All right, find it. I need it. I'm gonna right. send it out in the newsletter. <laughs> All right. I'll put it on my wall and make a graphic. All right, you guys. All right. All right. Kathy, I hope you painted some beautiful things tonight. Um and no, I'm just prepping. Oh, okay. All right. Well, <laughs> living on the edge, you guys keep living on the edge and, and we'll continue. Oh, as our axe lady. <laughs> and we'll keep living on the uh there it is. There it is. Yeah. What woman is, you're not a woman unless you got a good ax, right? Um, yep. Uh, so uh, uh, keep living on the edge. Keep, we'll keep this series going and continue to find women who, uh, in the Bible stories and even beyond, um, who are living on the edge. <laughs>